We're very excited tonight to have another veteran to the living room, Dr. Kyle Hogarth. Dr. Hogarth um, is professor of medicine, director of bronchoscopy and interventional pulmonology at the University of Chicago. Flew all the way out from University of Chicago and is on his way to Singapore. Thailand. I got that wrong last yeah, time. That was too. close. Thailand um, <laughs> tomorrow. So he was oh so kind as to make a pit stop here on, um, on his way out to talk to us um, about something that I know is near and dear to my heart, to my mom, Bonnie Adario's heart, to talk about pulmonology. As you know, and for those of you who have been watching this program for a long time, we bring this topic in quite often because we feel it's incredibly important to continue to remind you why it's important that you have a pulmonologist as part of your care team, again, regardless of where you are um, in, in your cancer experience. So. We want to have you guys understand and have a better understanding of what a pulmonologist's role is, when and why you should have a pulmonologist as part of your care team, and really a sense of empowerment because I know that a lot of you are either phone buddies and are, are part of a mentorship program with other more newly diagnosed patients or involved in online uh, programming or communities where patients and, and people diagnosed with lung cancer are talking with and giving advice to one another. So I really want everybody to feel empowered in understanding this and have, being able to have these conversations with other people in the community. Historically, pulmonologists were not involved in lung cancer care, sadly. Yeah, to be blunt, part of it was we, we, we probably didn't have as much to offer then as we do now. The diagnostics, there really wasn't good uh, things from a bronchoscopy perspective. Um, you know, we didn't prescribe chemotherapy, we didn't do surgery, we didn't have radiation. Like, we didn't do any of those things. So we were only marginally a part of it. We would diagnose some of the complications and kind of deal with them, but we didn't have a lot of the things we have now. So part of it's the profession's fault of, from pulmonary, that we sort of abdicated the space to others. But it's still, you know, it, it's incumbent upon us. We're lung doctors. This is a lung disease. Yes, it's a cancer, but it's a lung disease. And it doesn't matter if it's in other places, it's still a lung disease. And so it's part of what we do, and it's part of our training. So now, of course, things have changed dramatically in regards to my trainees. They, they learn a ton about everything related to lung cancer, obviously, no matter what their interests are, you know, if they go become a COPD doctor or whatever. But um, so, you know, things evolve, just like, obviously, thankfully, the entire world of lung cancer has been evolving. Yeah. Before we segue into and what we're going to be talking about are the role that a pulmonologist plays yeah. diagnostically, um, therapeutically and then man from a management standpoint. We've heard a lot, particularly in the last few years, about a pulmonologist and then an interventional pulmonologist. Can yep. you talk a little bit about the differences? Yeah, sure. An interventional pulmonologist is technically a pulmonologist. We've been trained in diseases of the lung, and that's all of them, right? So once you've heard of you know, asthma, COPD, cystic fibrosis, things like that. Interventional pulmonologists are people that do additional training or have additional focus and specialize on the procedural aspects of lung disease, most of which centers around cancer diagnostics, a lot that's moving, thankfully, towards cancer therapeutics, and then a lot of other things that are lumped into the palliative category, stenting an airway that's got a tumor invading it, for example. That field's continued to evolve, and now actually there's therapeutics that we do that have nothing to do with cancer, have everything to do actually for people with really bad COPD or emphysema to help them breathe better. So it requires a unique skill set and, and a lot of time. It has become its own specialty. Similar to you, you know, people that do cardiac catheterizations. They are a cardiologist, but they're the ones that are doing the stuff where they go in the groin and fix the vessels of the heart, but they don't do general cardiology anymore. Okay. That makes perfect sense, and I think you mentioned one word, and I just want to kind of squash any concerns that there might be about palliative and remind everyone when we're talking from a palliative perspective, we're talking about supportive care. Yeah, very um, much so. Yeah, and I think so. a lot of times it gets confused with hospice care. And oh, then, okay. Yeah. Well, so sorry if I stepped on the landline. Yeah, no. So palliative care from, from day one should be always part of a discussion because in what world... You know, this is what I always tell people. You know, medicine, a lot of what we do is, is pain and suffering. If we do a surgery on you, we're cutting you. We're causing a wound. It hurts. So it better have a purpose, right? Pain and suffering for the purpose makes sense. Pain and suffering without a purpose doesn't make sense. Not if there's things that I can do to alleviate your suffering. Even if that means whatever I have in front of me may not allow you to live longer, but if you can live better, 
Why am I not at least discussing that with you? And so, and again, I think the other key thing about interventional pulmonary and pulmonary in general is it's dialogue, it's a discussion. It's letting you know the options you have on the table. You may choose not to exercise them. You may not be a perfect candidate for something you read about online, whatever. But why aren't we at least talking about it? Why am I not part of your care team that's ensuring that you're breathing well? And, and all the things you and I are gonna talk yeah. about that go on. Yeah. So. We now have better diagnostic tools. We're on our third robot. We'll get into what a robot is in, in yep. just a second, um, how they work, you know, but let's start in the biopsy and biomarker testing sure. place. Well, actually, everybody's at, uh, experience and journey with, with lung cancer begins with an abnormal scan, typically. You might have had a symptom. You might not have had a symptom. But at some point, someone imaged you and said, there's a thing. And, and now it raised a question, right? And I can go give you a long list of all the possibilities of what that thing in your lung might be. And it's a long list. But until we take a biopsy, we're just guessing. And um, you know, all the testing might say the probability is very high, but until the sample's taken, don't know. And you know, even historically, again, let's talk about the evolution here. Historically, when we took a biopsy, all I had to do was prove that you had lung cancer, small cell or non-small cell. That was it. It didn't matter beyond that even though there were all these subtypes, but you treated them all the same, so nobody cared. Thank God the field has evolved dramatically. Now I definitively need to know, not just that it's lung cancer, what subtype, what's the mutational analysis, and I need at the same time, I should be able to stage you at the same time, right? Because lung cancer is one thing, but what stage am I? So when you have this abnormality, there's essentially three ways to perform a biopsy. Um, I will tell you the single greatest way, since it's what I do, um, <laughs> but all kidding aside, you obviously, can have surgery. And if you are proven to be early stage or by various testing, it sure looks like you're early stage and that the probability is high enough, it is reasonable in certain scenarios to go straight to surgery, to have it removed. It'll be both diagnosed and removed. There's a lot of caveats to that one. Because of course, there are a lot of mimickers of lung cancer. And so to have an unnecessary surgery where you've had part of your lung cut out for no reason, though I'm glad you don't have cancer, you just had an unnecessary surgery. That is kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, the amount of that is going down dramatically across the country. More and more thoracic surgeons will not operate without either proof of malignancy or that situation where I said it's very obvious. The other way is a needle biopsy. That's still a predominant method in this country, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately because it's fraught with complications. Very high rate of pneumothorax popping the lung. Um, a rate of bleeding that is small, but with no ability to control it, um, and it doesn't stage the patient. So if I biopsy this thing in your lung, and I proved it was the cancer we all were suspicious of, but what stage are you? I don't know. I didn't sample a single lymph node, because I can't sample a lymph node that way. So where bronchoscopy is arguably superior is that we will do both. We will go prove what that is, make sure we get enough tissue to run the molecular analysis, and then equally important, I'm gonna go sample every one of your lymph nodes and prove that there's no cancer there, so that you are stage one, or two, or three, or whatever, right? Someone will say, well, I had a PET scan. And the PET scan said my lymph nodes were negative, so I'm early stage. I wish that was true. Normal lymph nodes on X-ray, or on CT, and normal lymph nodes on PET scan still have about up to 10% chance of having cancer. So there's a one in 10 chance when your doctor says, good news, you're early stage, the scan says so. One in 10 chance, they're wrong. And historically, this approach was they would go and remove everything, and then they'd say, you're cured. And then six months later, your cancer would come back. And they go, ah, lung cancer is so aggressive. And in reality was, no, you were never stage one. They assumed you were stage one. And we all know the old adage about assumptions, right? You assume something, you know exactly where this goes. I want to prove what stage you are. So bronchoscopy offers both. Now, historically, though, our ability to get nodules was still limited, and that's where a lot of the advances in bronchoscopy, actually in, by lots of companies surrounding this building mm -hmm. and this part of the country, um, have helped innovate and grow what we can do. Um, and you mentioned the, the latest robot, that's just the next iteration of us trying to accomplish our only goal, which is to always make a diagnosis, prove what's going on, and stage you. And that's, of course, what's gonna lead us to someday also treating you from the inside. We're not there yet, it's all being studied, investigated, all trials, but someday. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna talk about that. And I think for those of you who remember 
um, back in the day having these types of conversations. And you might, I don't know if you know Ganesh Krishna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's, he's come in and talked about it. I actually had the honor of being, I don't know if you call it an operatory, or what do you, what do you call the room you do these? Bronx suites, usually. It's a Bronx but suite. Yeah, that is well, but I some think. people do them in the operating room. So no, you, this was a Bronx know. suite. You're yeah. right, you're right, you're right. Um, so with patient consent for me to be able to yeah. go in and um, watch this procedure, yeah. and it was Medtronic back then, mm -hmm. um, and it was truly unbelievable yeah. the sort of what good looks like in this space from, can you talk a little bit about what it looks like and how, how this works? Sure. Well, now where the robotic platforms are, you're asleep, anesthesia's knocked you out, there's a tube in your throat breathing for you. We put a scope down that. Now, historically, it's been a scope run with your hands. Looks like any scope that the GI doctor used on you or any other place, just one for the lungs. But now these robotic platforms, and again, they're all different in their shape and size, but it's essentially mechanically being driven the scope through the lungs. But you're using a controller. So track pads and Xbox and Game Boy controllers. I mean, it literally, no offense meant, it, it looks like a video game. Yeah. The humor of this, of course, is that I was born in 72, I got an Atari in the mid late 70s, my father telling me that video games were a colossal waste of time, <laughs> that unless I was gonna be an Air Force pilot, what would I need hand-eye coordination for? <laughs> the day I got my first robot, I sent a picture of my hands holding a controller and said, uh-huh. I mean, it was like, it was the ultimate like, yeah, you know? All those hours wasted playing Space Invaders were actually good for patients, right? So anyway, without trying to dive into the various technologies, Essentially what they do is they take your CAT scan. Now that CAT scan's a lot of data, and it essentially can be built into a three-dimensional map of the inside of you. And that three-dimensional map can be superimposed basically on top of you and inside the computer that's running this robot, allowing the physician to drive and snake their way to know to go right, then left, then up, then right, you know, whatever. Getting to that spot, using now for a lot of them incorporating various uh, imaging modalities so that we can further affirm that we're right where we need to be and then taking our samples and then having pathology in the room to confirm that we did get the diagnosis we need to get, um, did we get enough tissue, and then once that's done, pull the robot out, put in our ultrasound scope to sample all your lymph nodes and make sure that it hasn't spread. And then we do all that and then we wake you up and then you go home. And so, you know, and the thing is the bronchoscopy, the, the complication rate is infinitely lower than the, the other forms. The bleeding rate's lower. So we have a safer procedure um, that now, with the current iteration of technologies, seems to be on par with the interventional radiologist. So in other words, we are able to be as successful as they are, but safer. Mm -hmm. And we stage you, so it's a complete procedure, right? Because unfortunately, what happens a lot is I'll get a patient who We'll have a CAT scan, and you know, on the assumption that it's tumor, it clearly appears to be advanced stage. And someone will do a needle biopsy. But that doesn't answer a question for me. You know, they said, well, yes, it was adenocarcinoma. But we all kind of knew that in our gut. But what stage are they? So now they have to have a second procedure. And that, you know, it never happens the next day, right? There's always, I don't care how efficient your place is, there's, there's always a pathway to get you. So now more time is being wasted to get you the procedure that you need to stage you that if I had just done that first, back then, if we skipped the unnecessary needle biopsy. So if, please, like, there's a lot of people that do bronchoscopy around the country, so those that are at home uh, or watching or have been told they have a nodule, or have a friend who's been told they have a nodule, please find someone who does bronchoscopy and does it well to do your procedure so that they can also stage you if it happens to be malignant. Yeah, call us and we can help find one. It, it's so true. And like I said, having witnessed this, and this was, was the second robot? Was it, or not, this wasn't even a robot. This yeah, was the, it was the original stuff, super yeah. dimension. Yeah. was fascinating, the fact that they can get to the tumor regardless of where it is in the lung, yeah. pull nodes from, from wherever they are in your chest cavity, and truly be able to say, this is what we're looking at, is game changing. And it's a one and done. It's not, to your point, all the back and forth. And I don't know how many people in the room are online have gone and had a, either a fine needle aspiration or some other t type of biopsy, and we're like, yeah, the tissue was no good, like we've got yeah. nothing, right? Or didn't get enough. Or didn't get enough. Um, now, biomarkers and blood testing can help complete that story. You had asked me about that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a rapidly evolving area as well. Tumors shed, and they shed their DNA, and we can pick this up. And various companies, are, you know, there's a lot of people in this space for obvious reasons. Blood complements tissue. Um, so, because in the end, I want to know if you have a mutation that's 
amenable to a targeted therapy. Mm -hmm. Historically, the other, you know, amongst all the problems we've had with lung cancer, is that the approach has always been one size fits all. And I, I can guarantee no one in this room has ever bought anything one size fits all and had it fit, right? <laughs> it doesn't, it never fits, right? It's always the dumbest thing you own. Yeah. And so one size fits all had always been the historical approach to lung cancer, and we had the unfortunate outcomes to back up that experience, yeah. right? And so personalized management, like your tumor is different than the person sitting next to you. And in, in ways that we can quantify, not because you're different, your tumor's different. And, and that's what matters, mm -hmm. because that's gonna dictate how we treat you. Drug X isn't gonna work for you. No matter how much we, it's the miracle drug of the day, you, it doesn't work on your tumor at all, and we know this. Yeah. So you're not gonna get it, because why would we put you through something that has zero chance of helping you? Yeah. But meanwhile, this drug, amazing for your tumor. Yeah. But you need tissue for that, and you need the blood to back that up, mm -hmm. you need both. And so, if you're gonna have a procedure, get the right one, and the goal is to be one and done. Yeah. I don't want to bronch you again, yeah. ever. Yeah. I want to do it once, be done yeah. with it, and then yeah. move you on your journey. Yeah. No, I think it's important, and I love how we sort of wove in biomarker testing, particularly comprehensive biomarker testing. And this crew is very familiar with our, our firm feet in the ground stance on everyone should be able to have it. And it is so true. Like you mentioned back in the day, lung cancer was lung cancer. This is how it was treated. That That's was right. sort of it. But, and then it became, not only is lung cancer very personal to you, but in ways that we now don't think ever believed 15 years ago would be thinking about right now, right? And anyway, it's incredibly important. That wasn't that long ago. No. And no. Um, uh, when, it, when it was, uh, that's when we really started changing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But um, it, it, went on, it went on forever. Mm -hmm. and, well, uh, and the sad part is it's still going on. Yeah. And so yeah. the other thing, those yeah. watching at home, Unless you've got definitive proof that the mutational analysis of your tumor, there's not even a clinical trial for you to be in. There's, not, you know, there's <laughs> truly not a drug somewhere that we could give you because it's just the nature of your tumor. In right. that situation, then when they say, yeah, all we have is platinum-based therapies, fine. But until that's been done, then there's still potentially something else out there for you, whether right. that's a FDA-approved drug or a clinical trial, if you choose, et cetera. But there's, it's... Let me pause for a second. Has anybody really wondered why chemotherapies and targeted therapies and immune therapies are being advertised during Seinfeld reruns? <laughs> like, really? Like, why is that? I'll tell you why that is. It's because the physicians are not ordering the testing. And so they want the companies, who are obviously there to make a lot of money, want you to be proactive about it. Right. This is why we have things like this. So it's funny. When I first started doing genetic testing of tumors in my Bronx suite, we would make the diagnosis and we would take blood and immediately send it. And I got pushback from all these oncologists. They were like, uh-uh, you're not, you're not a cancer doctor. You can't send these things. And I, it's when I kind of puffed my chest out. And I said, well, first of all, my patient, not your patient, not yet, my patient. Yeah. So my patient needs an advocate, which is me, and I'm going to get them the results they need so they can arrive at your office knowing what mutations that you can then start to give them the correct therapy. Because one size fits all doesn't work. And once they got over their ego, they realized, oh, this is great. So then once in a blue moon, like, the blood won't get sent, you know, like, just oops. And I get this, like, where the hell's the blood? You know, so, like, we, we broke them. We got them to understand that they have to have this. And the thing is, what everyone does need to understand about these blood tests, oncologists have their favorite ones. One company X versus company Y versus company Z. The way Medicare works, it will pay for one of these tests per company per patient. So if they want to send all seven of them on you, which is stupid, but let's pretend, it's all covered. Now, they want to send it a second time, it's not. That, that's out of your pocket. So, but wait, are you saying that, let's assume, and I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but I want to do it because it's relevant to this information. If you get a liquid biopsy, whether along with your, your, your tissue yep. or, or not, and it's only sent to one company, if you need another one upon progression, you can right. send it to another company. So look, I'll give you covered. examples. I, I don't know if I'm supposed to use company names or not. But you I'll, can, go ahead. Awesome. So when I do your bronchoscopy and I make your diagnosis, we send the Biodesix IQ lung right then and there. Yeah. In our, and why? Because it only tests for actual mutations up front, the, the one, not some research stuff, just ones we can do today. And I get the results back before five days. Yeah. And so by the time the final results come back from your pathology and you're seeing the oncologist, we already know. Meanwhile, all the other tests take two to three weeks. So you go to see the oncologist, you say, I have cancer, what are we gonna do about it? And they go, yeah, we gotta wait for some tests to come back. 
What do you mean you gotta wait for some tests to come back? Well, I wanna send this one. So my oncologists love a couple of the Biodesics competitors. Great, they send them. My hospital has our own molecular pathology lab. We run molecular analysis off of the slides we make in the Bronx suite. So you're getting you know, up and down, left and right proof that you have this mutation or that mutation automatically, but why not? This is how it should be. When someone's like, well, these tumor, you know, these mutations aren't common. Again, they are if you look. It's interesting because you, know, you can predict what percentage there should be of a, of a mutation. So if, if you're a, a company that makes a chemo or a targeted therapy for it, you should expect X amount of prescriptions, right? You can, relatively speaking, predict for this. And all these companies were saying, there should be this many people on my drug, and there's this many people on my drug. What the heck? And it was this. Well, well, yeah, but it was lack of testing. And I know folks, again, <laughs> that, are, that have been with GoTo and following this programming and others recognize the importance of it. And I couldn't agree more, particularly in smaller community, more rural settings. This testing is not being done. Right. Like period, hard stop. Forget the Bronx suite and any of that fancy stuff. Right. Like the, regardless of how they get the, the tissue. like There's it, still a lot of one size fits all happening in this country. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's why it's important to educate, empower, and then yep. advocate not only for yourself, but for others. One of the things, we touched on CT scans and PET a little bit, and when yep. you and I were talking prior to this, you were very, very passionate about quality CT scans. Oh, yeah. Not and this all is relevant <laughs> at diagnosis and, and everything in between. progression, yeah. So there are guidelines on how CAT scans should be done, and they're not followed. A CAT scan, is, as fancy as it is, is essentially, you know, they're taking slices of you, but there's a lot of averaging going on, right? Higher resolution, better. I get a better look at your lung, right? That means lots of different things to lots of different people, but high resolution should be thin slices continuous. In other words, when I scan you, I should have about 360 pictures of you to look through. And that, that takes a while, doesn't it? But what happens across the country frequently is you're getting what are called three millimeter cuts. So there's only 120 pictures of you, or worse, there's still places that do five millimeter cuts. Five millimeter cuts is the equivalent of whatever TV you have on the wall right now. Think of the TV you had 50 years ago. That's what you have, that's what your doctor's looking at making decisions about you. And here's what ends up happening. When we're still dealing in the stage of we don't know what you've got, you get patients who shop around on CAT scans. And so they come with a five millimeter cut scan, a three millimeter cut scan, and they finally get a good scan. And someone says, yeah, your nodule went from four millimeters to five millimeters. No, it didn't. You had a lousy scan followed by another lousy scan, someone going like this, and that's one millimeter growth is not growth. Or maybe it is, which is why you need a real scan. By the way, it's not more radiation. You, know, you hear high resolution, like, oh, they must be really zapping me. No, it's everything about detector quality. It's about the quality of the scanner. It's whether or not that center has bought a CT scanner in the last five years or 10 years or 20 years, mm -hmm. right? If you pull up to your hospital and that CT scanner is on a truck, go someplace else. Right. <laughs> so I guess that was going to be sort of my Not the pet scanner. Pet scanners are very expensive and the mobile ones are fine. But cat scanners, move on. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the bigger question that I, that I would imagine a lot of people would have is how do they know outside mm. of the truck? How do they know and what should they be asking? I want to know if my scan's going to be thin cuts with a continuous intervals. Meaning, like, like the deli, slice, slice, slice. Not slice, skip halfway down the meat, then slice again. Because that's the other definition of high res cuts. They do one thin cut, and oops, and then jump midway down you and do another thin cut and then jump midway down you. The snapshots of you. And they've not, missed all that. Yeah, they miss, miss everything in there, yeah. right? I mean, and remember, this is, so fine, this is where on the diagnostic side yeah. of whether your, your nodule's concerning. Let's go the different direction. Now you've been diagnosed. Now we're trying to judge your response to therapies. Now we're trying to judge whether or not you're developing complications from therapies. If you're gonna get radiated, why not get the most bang for your buck? And quite literally, less radiation with a higher quality scanner, ironically. Quite often, particularly a follow-up scan, somebody's in treatment and they ask, well, two things, and I know this probably runs in the med -onc sort of space, but they, question number one, CT or PET, and I know we're gonna talk about PET in just a second, but yep. CT or PET and how often, and I know the, con the, and you and I had talked about the contrast thing yep. too, and I think that a lot of people are gonna be very surprised 
to hear that. And some people might also be like, what the hell's contrast? I've never even had that. So if the scan's done right, you don't need the contrast. And so without some certain scenarios, you might. There also may be, if you're in a research protocol, there may be a scenario where you need contrast because they need some specific technical issues. So again, it's not that no contrast ever, but majority of the time, it is not needed. And what is it? It's radio opaque, right? So the lung is mostly air. So the lung looks black on CT and dark gray. And you want to be able to highlight other structures and vessels will look a different shade of gray. But if I make them white because of contrast, then it's very obvious what's a vessel versus what's not a vessel. But if you have a good resolution scan and you're scrolling up and down, and this is all you do is look at scans, so you don't need it. I, I make this statement because I was trained by the gentleman who wrote the Fleischer Society guidelines, and he taught me how to read CAT scans. He's one of the, he's retired now, but Heber McMahon is arguably one of the best thoracic radiologists in the world ever. And if Heber said, I don't need contrast, then I don't need contrast. So on the contrast thing, I don't really understand how it works. So does that make it easier to read? Does it make more difference between something and something else? Or what is the real value add of contrast in the first place? The contrast is needed when you need to definitively see the vasculature. So if I worry you've had a pulmonary embolism, I have to give contrast because I need to be able to have your blood vessels filled up with this white stuff and see the, the filling defect, the clot that's sitting in there. Um, if you're coughing up blood, but there's no reason we think you should be coughing up blood. There's not a tumor in your airway. Um, why is he coughing up blood? So then you do that because that highlights all the vessels. And then you see some weird vessel in the area where you maybe got radiated and it's twisted and it's, you know, you can even sometimes see that it's leaking. Not often. So that'd be the other reason to do it. But if all I'm trying to do is follow a tumor that has been you know, is undergoing chemotherapy, and then is it shrinking, right? That they, every three months, they're going to scan you. Is it shrinking? Are you responding? You don't need contrast for that. You can see it. You can see it shrink. You can you just measure it. I want to jump into PET. Okay. Let's jump into PET. PET's an interesting discussion, so let's let's take it from the, the range here. So for those that are listening and watching who are not yet either, you know, they've been told they may have a diagnosis, or they've been told they have a diagnosis, but we don't know what stage they are. Um, so PET scans get done as part of that workup in some places. So the thing to remember about a PET, a PET measures things that are metabolically active. What does that mean? So it means your brain's going to light up. For most of us in the world, there's, some, there's something going on upstairs, <laughs> right? Meaning you're thinking, so you're using glucose. They're injecting radioactive glucose, right? Sugar. Your brain sucks down a lot of sugar. Your heart lights up. Your heart sucks down a lot of sugar. The rest of your body, generally speaking, isn't doing much work at a given moment, right? So the brain and heart light up, and everything else should essentially be, quote, cold on PET scan because it's measuring the accumulation of this radioactive glucose. So for those that have been had a biopsy-proven tumor, the tumor will light up because we know it's a cancer. It's a metabolically active thing. It's growing, so it's sucking up a lot of sugar. So the PET scan will light up there. But if you don't know what you have, if, you have, if I do a PET scan on anyone in this room who has pneumonia at the time, like true pneumonia, it will light up. Did you know that after, if you just, right before coming in, show me your ankle. If we did a PET scan on you right now, your foot's going to light up because you have an injury. It actually feels hot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have an injury, though. Yeah. If you get kicked on the way in or banged your elbow on the way in, your elbow's going to light up. Right? So, I mean, so, in other words, a positive PET scan doesn't automatically mean you have tumor. Now... In some cases, though, it, it unfortunately is very useful. We've proven you have a malignancy. We're worried it's advanced stage. The PET scan can help to clarify extent. In other words, it finds areas in the bone that have lit up. And there's no reason those should be lit up. So that means, unfortunately, that it has spread to the bones or the adrenal glands or things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a value to a PET to oh, sometimes, in some scenarios, spare a patient from a longer drawn out procedure when we already clinically look like it's advanced stage, go get tissue, go prove what's going on so we can get this person started on tailored therapy. Now, the role of repetitive PET scanning, that's definitely a question more for MedOnc. Mm -hmm. um, my always fear about or concern about PETs when decisions get made solely based on PET activity. When a PET's negative, that's very reassuring. Even if something's cancerous, because PETs can be negative and still in the setting of tumor, but it means it's a very slow-growing tumor. So we do have time on our side in that situation. But I live in Chicago. 
Histoplasmosis and blastomycosis are endemic in our part of the country, and it's pretty broad. Those light up like a Christmas tree on PET scan, and they're a spiculated, nasty-looking nodule. They look like cancer. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Because it's metabolically active. It's a fungal infection. Okay. It's in the, anything that drains along the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley. So it's a good chunk of the country. You guys get, not so much up here, but Southern California and Arizona and New Mexico gets all the coxie, mm -hmm. coccidiomycosis. And so in Chicago, though, all my people leave for the winter and either go to Florida or Arizona. So they bring coxie back to where I'm at. And my, my point being is I've had plenty of people come to see me who said, my primary order to PET scan, they've told me I have lung cancer. I said, well, who did your biopsy? They said, well, I haven't had a biopsy. I said, well, you may have lung cancer. I mean, it's, it's on the list, right? But there's a long other things on that list, which is what we're going to go prove or disprove. Now, if the PET scan was stone cold negative, like no activity, that's part of that discussion of, do I need to do a biopsy? Maybe I don't. Maybe it's, maybe it's a questionable nodule. Maybe your medical health makes doing a biopsy a challenge. And a negative PET scan would argue whatever this is, it's not metabolically active. Remember, the lung also scars. Sometimes for a lot of people, this is your, the CAT scan that found your cancer is your first CAT scan, typically, right? So no one's, it's like, and someone will say, I see a patient, they'll say, well, why do I have this thing in my lung? I'm like, well, did you ever have bronchitis or pneumonia? Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, there it is. <laughs> you know, the lung scars like your skin. We all have cuts and wounds from everything. Your lungs is no different. This is the negative of how good CAT scans are. I do want to get into the treatment and management part because sure. I think that's going to be relevant. But real quick, the yeah, pet, the, if your oncologist says I need a PET scan every six months for whatever reason, I'm not a medical oncologist, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. fight that one, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, I, I, they use it to gauge response to therapy. But I think sort of the moral of this front, this upfront part around diagnostics in particular there's sort of the, the trifecta of the three, right? Appropriate biopsying, yep. including lymph nodes, appropriate CT scans with your thin cuts, yep. and a PET scan. And with, with those three diagnostic tools, you can come to... Well, and there's even some other blood work too, right? So there's the serologic work for these infections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's the notify test that BioDesix does that helps to quantify a nodule's risk for cancer. Because again, not every nodule automatically needs to be a biopsy, right? It all depends on what's the probability that it's malignant. What's the safety factor involved in making your diagnosis? So. Yeah. This has all been incredibly insightful. I actually have learned a lot. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I mean, I knew most of these things. I know you did. That means I um, talk too much, and I'm sorry. No, no, I actually did, especially when talking about CTs and PETs and the importance of it. I think that's, that's very relevant at diagnosis, and I think it's very rele relevant when we're thinking about maybe a follow-up scan showing something and whether or not it did or yep. it didn't and how we either need to continue to follow it and or re-biopsy and the like. But now I, want to, I do want to jump into some treatment, not only on managing disease, but also managing symptoms. Sure, and this is yet another reason to have a pulmonologist. Um, but also, before I even say that, let's, let me back up. The biggest thing that I see frequently with any cancer patient, not just lung, is understandably it becomes the primary focus, as it should be, but to the detriment of everything else in their health. So they stop their cholesterol medication, they stop seeing their primary care doctor, their blood pressure is out of control, their diabetes is out of control, whatever, whatever, right? So you go through all this with cancer, come out the other side and have a massive heart attack because you ignored the rest of your health, or get colon cancer because you didn't get a colonoscopy, or stop getting mammograms because I have lung cancer. You can still get breast cancer, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's so the whole reason why then from you know, my neck of the woods is Obviously, lung cancer can happen, smokers, non-smokers, current smokers, ex-smokers, never smokers. But if you have any amount of smoking-rated lung disease, it needs to be treated. Like, in what world would you be continuing to be short of breath from something that I have simple inhalers for, right? If the tumor is compressing an airway and is significantly making it hard to breathe, and they haven't even started therapy yet, they're going to radiate chemo. Let us get in there and dilate the airway. Let us stent the airway in some cases. Let's let you breathe better while you start down whatever pathway. Are you doing pulmonary rehabilitation? Have you do, are you, which is basically a formal way of saying, we're going to make you exercise, and it's <laughs> going to be covered by Medicare. And you should if you have lung disease, like obstructed lung disease. Um, don't neglect the rest of you. 
Because no matter what you go through, whether it's a targeted therapy or chemo, radiation, immunotherapy or surgery, your body's going to take some level of abuse, which is a wide variety. So get your body as ready as possible by staying on top of everything else. Most people don't have sort of like a baseline pulmonary function test, right, right. that they're kind of kicking off from. But, but how they should. They should. <laughs> and, and that's what I was just going to say. How important is it for people diagnosed with lung cancer to get even that baseline and then follow up to so see... If, yeah. So if you've been a smoker at all, you should totally get a pulmonary function test because we've got to know if you have obstructive lung disease. If you're a lifelong non-smoker and you have lung cancer, the pulmonary function testing is less vital in the sense that you, unless you've had significant secondhand smoke exposure or industrial exposure, et cetera. But it's only necessary if some of the therapies that are going to be employed are potentially pulmonary toxic. But if you're short of breath, you say, when I go walking, I'm short of breath. But there's a long list of potential reasons. Starting with the fact you might be anemic. Yeah. Right? You may have COPD. You might have heart disease. You might have thyroid disease. I mean, the list goes on. There's a long list of reasons. Never just assume it's your lungs, but go see the pulmonologist so we can say. Some of the happiest times I get to say is like, you don't have lung disease. Yes, you can't breathe. Here's why. We go figure out why, but it's not the lungs. Frequently it is the lungs, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. but let us do something about it. As part of your cancer, you may have a large pocket of fluid inside the chest cavity, squishing half your lung. You're not breathing with a full deck. Let's get the fluid out of you. We drained it. It came back a week later. Okay, well, then let's do a different procedure to keep it from coming back, right? Because draining you once a week is not a solution, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But we need to be able to make sure that at all times we're dealing with your breathing. If you're going through your therapies and now you're having more trouble breathing, and you just go, well, you know, but I've been through a lot. You know, and they said sometimes this cause problems, so that's probably all it is. Well, except there are significant amounts of pulmonary toxicities from, from some of the drugs. You can definitively get what's called a pneumonitis from some of the immune therapies. This matters, because if you're having a really severe reaction, we may have to abandon some of the therapies you're on, depending, right? If you're developing a new pleural effusion, we need to get that fluid out of you. If your tumor has progressed and is obstructing an airway, let's deal with that. There's so many different things that we can do to help you breathe better. That's why earlier at the beginning I said palliative. Palliative to me, it is a word that I wish we could come up with a different word that wouldn't have any bad connotations. Mm -hmm. Anything I can do that controls symptoms, that gets lumped under the palliative category, how's that a bad thing? I mm -hmm. want you feeling better. Mm -hmm. That's always good. So what about the patient, because quite often people will have surgical options. Sure. So they've had a lobectomy or a pneumonectomy. So either part or all of Yeah. Right? They're missing that, lung. That compromises lung function. It can, sure. And in fact, part of the evaluation for surgery is to, do you have enough lung capacity that when we remove X amount of lung, how's your breathing going to be? Mm -hmm. It will potentially be diminished mm -hmm. from where it was, but if when someone has been told, hey, you're early stage, but you can't get surgery because of whatever. And it's usually almost always related to the degree of lung disease they have, usually yeah. COPD or emphysema. Yeah, yeah. But the inhalers and pulmonary rehab can improve this. We like to call it prehab. You should be, before, you know, they say, all right, you need surgery, it's gonna be in three weeks. That three weeks, you should be very active. You need to sort of, you know, rewatch Rocky and hit the gym, you know, yeah. and, and <laughs> yeah. get yourself going. You will do better with surgery. Yeah. So we talked about airway stenting, we talked about PFT. We have, we have ways to ablate tumor too. We've got yeah. various energy-based things that, I mean, there's multiple options. And not everybody's got, a, you know, not everything's an option. And there's multiple studies going on on other ways to try to minimize tumor. That's the point though, that until someone says, no, there's nothing I can debulk, there's nothing I can stent, you're on the best inhalers, you've done the pulmonary rehab, your heart is good, you're this, I'm still very short of breath, then, I don't have a better answer, but we've mm -hmm. at least checked all the boxes. Because mm -hmm. again, I'm interested in you feeling better. Mm -hmm. No matter where you are and what you're going through, you still deserve to breathe better and feel better mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great sort of segue into, particularly when traveling to high altitudes or flying long distances. Yeah, it's challenging. An altitude test, why is that important? I mean, so when you're up at 36,000 feet in that plane, you're not getting 
the same partial pressure of oxygen as you get down here. You may discover, unfortunately, at 36,000 feet that you needed oxygen. That's not the best time to discover it. Mm -hmm. If you're someone who needs oxygen with altitude, um, you can fly with oxygen. It's just like all things in this world, paperwork and logistics. Mm -hmm. Don't expect to show up you know, an hour before the flight and say, oh, by the way, I need oxygen. You're not getting on that flight. Yeah. And every airline, of course, has its own form and requirements. Yeah. But it's easy to do. I've got, again, remember as a pulmonologist, I've got a ton of patients with emphysema, COPD, and other diseases that need oxygen all the time that have nothing to do with malignancy. We do this all the time. Yeah. I'll go ahead and dispel the first myth that usually comes up as soon as oxygen gets mentioned. I will hear it pretty much every day in clinic. Well, I don't want to get dependent on this stuff. Little news flash. <laughs> We're all dependent on oxygen, right? <laughs> um, and in fact, so you're already dependent on it, so embrace it. But number two, um, you don't make yourself stronger by robbing yourself of oxygen. You actually make yourself weaker. You're asking your body to do twice the work. Why would you do that to yourself? I understand no one wants to wear oxygen. It is a visible outward sign that you're ill. I get that. But if you're going through everything else to propagate your health, you're going to skimp on this one, right? I mean, really? Like, let's, let's keep you at maximum capacity, right? Trials. So we touched a little yeah. bit on, on trials. Talk a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, in so, your world. Well, so there's, oh my gosh, in, in my world there's tons of trials, especially obviously on the therapeutic side. Mm -hmm. The goal of, I mean, take your pick. Obviously, cure is always the first goal. If we could find a way to cure lung cancer from the inside, no surgeries, no radiation, no, you know, amazing, right? That is the moonshot, and that's the goal. And we'll get there. Um, it's going to take time. Um, and there's a lot of bumps along the way. It both needs to obviously prove it's got to work, it's got to be safe. Right? I'm not doing any good if I can say, well, I can cure this many people, but I harm this many people. You know, no thanks, right? And so, and truly harm. But there's also at the same time, a lot of different therapies um, being developed to sort of, for lack of a better word, prime the immune system, right? You've been hearing about immunotherapies. You know, tumors are very good at hiding from the immune system. And your immune system views tumors as foreign, or it should. So if you can go in and sort of disrupt a significant amount of tumor by different and multiple different methodologies, in fact, it's one of the things I'm lecturing on in Thailand, the idea is you kind of expose it all to the immune system and get a more revved up response. Or if you've been responding to immunotherapy and then starting to lose response, maybe this lets us recharge things. Again, all of these are under investigation, being looked at as a possibility. But the fact that we're even saying this is part of the awesome news of what's going on in lung cancer, because this wasn't talked about at all a decade ago. Therapeutic what? No, not at all. No, you know what? Nobody, you know, it's yeah. like, it, it, not at all. So clinical trials, people's involvement with the clinical trials, obviously a very personal decision. You are, without a doubt, volunteering, right? I mean, there's always some trials, some trials will offset travel costs, some trials are gonna be a nominal, it's never worth the money, right? You're only doing it because you're interested in what it's discussing, or from an altruistic perspective, you're wanting to advance the field. And what I always remind everybody is that you know, where we are today only happened from clinical trials, and where we were a decade ago happened from clinical trials. So we're all standing on the success of clinical trials and the volunteer spirit of the people that signed up for it. Now, that being said, you're still signing up for something that is considered experimental. And there are various levels of trials, so there's like uber experimental to something that like Pretty much everyone's sure it's going to work. We just got to prove it last, right? So phase one to phase three, mm -hmm. and you can choose to sign those up. And also, the other thing, too, is trials have rules and requirements. You may be the most perfect candidate for the trial, but the cutoff age is 65, and you're 66. Sorry. Like, and there, there's no getting around that. Like, that's, these are trials that are ultimately going to the FDA. Trust me, the, the people running the trials really want you in the study. They would Ooh. love to have you in the study, but they can't. It will, they will basically get dinged and it will ruin the study. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not that someone doesn't want to help you. We're not allowed to. And, and as I always remind people too, when people desperately want to be in a trial and then for whatever reason can't get in, and understandably very frustrated by that, not everything works. And in some cases, trials show that the thing is actually worse. So in some cases, not getting in the study might have helped you. Mm -hmm. And when everyone understandably doesn't want to be in a placebo trial or doesn't want to be in a sham controlled study, Sometimes a placebo does better. And remember, frequently, almost, unless it's phase one trials, like a lot of the phase three th trials for the various targeted therapies, it's standard of care plus. So you're not getting nothing. You're getting what everyone gets. The tr study is you're either getting the, the sugar pill, quote, quote, sugar pill, or the drug, 
to see if it makes a difference. And then it gets monitored along the way, because of course, no one talks about the trials that get halted halfway through because it turns out the drug's ridiculously toxic. Yeah. It doesn't work at all, Yeah. right? Those don't make the press. Yeah. I think it's interesting. We've done a lot of talk about clinical trials in here, and yeah. a huge kudos and, and thank you to those who have participated, some of whom are in this very room and I'm sure are watching right now, because it has advanced the field. And there are some instances where a clinical trial is the best decision for you based yeah, on where you are sure. in your journey. We've sort of talked around it, but I don't know if we talked specifically to it, the importance of a multidisciplinary care team. Yeah. Everybody having these conversations about you, personalizing, whatever next step or action is to you. We talked about how lung cancer is not what we thought it was even 15, 20 years ago, right. but it's really become this series of rare cancers. It's not just 225,000 people in the US are diagnosed every year with lung cancer. It's like, wow, we have really broken it down yeah. into many rare diseases. And there's there's a lot of personalization that, that goes along with that. And the reason you need the multimodality, because you, know, you only know what you know. In other words, I will freely admit, I have no idea what new targeted therapy came out last week. I'm sure one did. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't prescribe them. I'm not yeah. a medical oncologist. Yeah. I try to keep up, but there's only so much I can keep up. But I guarantee you my medical oncologists are not keeping up with the latest and greatest therapies that we offer on the bronchoscopy side or the clinical trials that we offer there. And the radiation oncologists have a whole bunch of new different t tips and tricks and techniques and things they can do, et cetera, et cetera. The point being that why you need multimodality, this field's gotten wonderfully complicated, yeah. which is great. It's a Awesome problem to have. It used to be ridiculously easy to do lung cancer because yeah. you didn't have to know anything. Yeah. And so this is yeah. a wonderful plethora of riches. But that means then why you need a squad because you want to know what your options are, especially if you're ever at that stage where they're telling you your tumor's progressed, I have no other therapies for you. Until you've been evaluated for clinical trials, if those interest you, been evaluated for any bronchoscopic-based trial that might prime an immune-based response, until radiation oncology doesn't talk about some of the things that they've got under their belt, until we've done a, a mutational analysis and see that there's not some study that just launched. Because remember, maybe you weren't a candidate for some drug two years ago because it didn't exist, yeah. right? It was an early phase trial, but now it's in its phase three trial. And now your mutation is good for it. Go, 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 right? Again, and you may not be a candidate, you may not want to, but until you've exhausted the possibility of studies and other things, when someone says, I don't have any other treatment options for you, then you should be looking. And then, and then if that's not there or those don't interest you, then unfortunately that's the stage you've reached at. Okay, but you at least could comfortably know that there's nothing else that you didn't try. And you've made the right decision. And you've for made you. the right decision for you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Obviously, I adore Kyle and his approach and how he can bring levity to what is a very serious and confusing um, diagnosis for people. Because I think, well, you guys all know, at least in the room, the levity that was around at the time of my mother's diagnosis through her treatment and still today was so needed and, and helpful yeah. and allowed the hope in the room. So anyway, this is what Dr. Hogar said. He said, people with lung cancer have compromised lung functions, but sadly, a lot of times, a learned helplessness. Yeah. You can and should keep doing all of the things that make you happy, and a pulmonologist can help you do just that. So, you know, you shouldn't find yourself limitless without first finding out whether or not there is an option to get you, your quality, to a place where you can go do all the things that you've always wanted to do. Sorry. So. I hope you don't mind that, no, I, no, that I read that. No, but it's that. true. It's um, true. Yeah, yeah. And I want to give a huge, huge thank you um, to my friend, Dr. Kyle Hogarth, <laughs> for flying all the way out here from Chicago on his way to Thailand. Um, <laughs> all of you watching live or post live, Penn Media, as usual, for coming in, setting up, breaking down, getting us all ready for this so that we can bring it to anyone, regardless of where they may be in the world. Appreciate you. Go to st staff, there's a couple of them here, thank you. And for all of those that aren't here, um, of course I need to give a huge shout out to our supporters, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, Isai Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Merck, Marathi Therapeutics, Novartis, Novacure, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda. Without their support, we couldn't continue to bring this to you. And that's all folks, we're gonna call it a wrap. Come get some cake. Mm -hmm. Thanks everybody. So I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if
Dios.